here in Hull. Good morning. My name is Domenico Sesto. I am the chairman of the Hull Board of Selectmen. Uh, for those I haven't met, uh, it's a pleasure. I'm glad you all came here tonight. I was looking through the pamphlet uh, this morning when I was having coffee, and what a great group. I'm so glad that we have so much brain power in one room, and I was wondering if we could add an agenda item to maybe crack the lottery code, because I bet if there's uh, any group of people who could do it, it's this group here. Um, like I said, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, as you know, that town has made wind a priority for many years. In 2001, uh, we put up our first windmill. In 2004, we put up our second windmill, Hull Wind 1, Hull Wind 2. Uh, the town itself has made a big commitment uh, to wind, <clears throat> and we've also made a big commitment to today. This is uh, about a year and a half, two years in the making uh, to put this event together because we believe that wind and renewable energy is the future for our country, but also here in Hull. As I said, I'm, I am grateful that you came today. I really believe that today is historic. We have a, a small group of people here with a small town who are joining together to do something that uh, I believe is, is very important. It's something that us as a country uh, needs to do, to be more dependent on our renewables and less dependent on our fossil fuels. I, I will apologize in advance. I, I have to step out shortly. I'll be in and out all day. I have other appointments. Um, but I look forward to uh, speaking with some of you for the course of the day. I'm going to leave you with um, an introduction to our operations manager, Mr. Dick Miller. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dick Miller, and thank you. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to uh, Hull in a beautiful day, as you can see if you look outside. We have some, if we hit some wave attenuators, would be all right, I guess. But uh, we started out down in um, Hull Wind 1 in 2001. Prior to that, it was always called Windmill Point because back in the 18th century, uh, the fishermen had windmills down there that sucked the seawater in to drying vats to create salt, to salt the cod they caught and ship back to England. And then with that in mind, back in the early 80s, mid 80s, we put a 40 kW machine up, the high school did, and operated that till uh, for about five or six years. And then due to lack of maintenance and everything, Northeaster came in much like the one that's hit us the last three days and there's parts of that thing in France. Nobody's been able to find it. But uh, that kind of set the groundwork for us to build Halloween 1 with very little uh, outcry from the public. Matter of fact, there was quite a bit of endorsement from the public. And uh, we've always been kind of a free spirited community. You know, we were built by pirates. They say the Coast Guard started here, but I think they were actually the guys who were lighting the fires to wreck the ships. But, you know, <laughs> the byproduct, they saved a few lives. And, uh, I think we, um, you know, we've shown, we've shown time and time again that we're willing to try something new, try something different, and uh, as long as it benefits our ratepayers and our, our citizens of the town. So once again, I just want to welcome you. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope we can bring something away from this technology panel and, and financing and all the different aspects of it. I mean, we do have about the best and brightest we could find here. and. Uh, you know, myself excluded, of course. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce Andy Stern, who put the event together for us as the event coordinator. And he's, many of you in the wind world know him as a, an expert on his own. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Dick. And uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to, uh, from Hull to uh, allow me to put such a, a comprehensive event together. I, I think I have to agree with Dick. We've got some of the best and brightest in industry, government, and academia uh, here. Uh, combined with community, I don't think uh, there's much that can stop uh, clean energy. Um, and the one last thing I wanted to say is, uh, not only am I proud of this, of, of, of this event and the turnout, but I'm proud to be from Hull. I actually grew up here. and. Uh, Hopefully, we'll be doing some uh, more wind and uh, clean energy activity in the town. So welcome all. Thank you for the speakers that have come a uh, great distance. Uh, we've got some, uh, the AP high school uh, uh, science class back here. And it uh, should be a great day. There'll be plenty of time for networking and breaks. 
and uh, feel free to, uh, to, to grab the speakers uh, during the networking breaks. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the town manager who has the vision of, of a clean town, a, a, a town that uh, generates uh, right now over 15% of its energy through the use of wind, wind energy. And it was his vision uh, and the town's vision back in 97 uh, to repower the site uh, down at Windmill Point. And uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Phil Lemnios. Phil? All right, good morning, everyone. I'm going to make this short so we can get to our keynote speaker and then get into the conference. Um, but there is one person in the audience today, Malcolm Brown. I don't know if he could stand up for us. Um, Malcolm Brown is actually the father of wind and hull. And um, many, many, many years ago, uh, Mr. Brown came into my office and met with myself and Pat Cannon, who is the chairman of the light board, who is here I know as well. And at the time, the operations manager, John McLeod, and this kind of wild-eyed guy came in and said, you know, you really got to look into these windmill things. And this was back, um, you know, back in the mid-90s. And we were true skeptics, uh, as most people are who are ignorant uh, on this particular industry. And through his persuasive ability and through his intellectual ability to explain something, he's a former professor, he managed to turn, uh, you know, some bumpkin skeptics into uh, true advocates uh, for uh, this industry. And another person sitting in the room who's going to be a participating, James Manuel from the University of Mass, has played a magnificent role in educating uh, all folks who are who are laypersons within this industry to the benefit of it. So I'm very excited to have Jim here as well as a speaker. Um, we're going to introduce the keynote in one second, but I want to give you guys, I believe there's a one nugget theory for every conference, that if you go to a conference and you can walk away with just one nugget out of a whole day's worth of activities, it was worth it. And a dear friend of mine taught me that theory. So here's the one nugget I'm going to try to give you. Next April Fool's Day, and this is what we do here, when somebody will ask us about our windmills and it happens to be April Fool's Day, we say, yeah, they're the largest coal-fired windmills on the East Coast. And that usually gets them to pause a little bit and think about it. And they'll ask us, well, where's the exhaust? We say, yeah, it's about a mile offshore. You see a little plume of smoke off there. That's from the coal burning. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Steve Clark. Um, Steve has been, um, works currently as an assistant secretary uh, for the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs here in the state of Massachusetts. And his particular portfolio is energy uh, concerns, sustainable in particular. And I know Steve has been there for many years and um, has always been a very gracious um, advocate at the governmental level for uh, sustainable projects and has been one of those people that when you call up and have a problem, he will try to help solve the problem. So he's been a great advocate on the state level for uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts as well as I believe the industry. Um, and so it's a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Mr. Clark as our keynote speaker. So thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for having me here today. And uh, I want to thank Phil in particular for inviting me to uh, participate in this great conference with all of you. I um, also want to applaud Hall um, in general for their pioneering leadership. Um, around clean energy and wind energy in particular, and their drive to really achieve um, energy security and energy independence at a municipal scale, um, which, um, you know, a few years ago was really sort of at the cutting edge um, when it came to Massachusetts. And uh, they continue to push uh, the envelope um, by, with their forays into offshore wind energy, um, which we've been actively involved with and supporting. So really want to applaud them for their leadership. So um, now they're some tremendous uh, uh, brains in this room, and I, and I also will be brief so you can actually hear from the folks who are the experts on, uh, on this, you know, the topic at hand today, which is offshore wind energy. I just wanted to provide a very quick sort of um, snapshot of where we are in Massachusetts um, on wind energy in general, and then sort of uh, pass it on to, to the great panelists that we have today. Um, I want to also thank and applaud all of you. Many of you in this room have been working very actively um, to help us bolster our wind energy sector here in Massachusetts, 
we've experienced, um, you know, quite frankly, a wind energy revolution is what we're calling it. We've seen tremendous growth in wind energy in just the past four years. And in large part, that's come from a lot of the collaboration um, from a variety of different stakeholders. Everyone from academia, like folks like Professor Manuel, to the state, you know, we've got folks like Greg Watson and Bill White and Nils Bolgen, as well as municipalities and nonprofits like Mass Audubon, CLF, broad swath of stakeholders that have come together and really helped Massachusetts experience tremendous amount of wind energy growth in a short amount of time. So what I'll do is um, just quickly go through some of the, uh, let's see if I got this straight here. Uh, Here we go. All right, so um, these are sort of the obvious reasons why, why we're all here. I won't belabor this. Um, this. This I always find sort of informative or interesting to come back to this. This is really the driver um, in, 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 in sort of a large part for um, the governor's high prioritization of wind energy. Um, this basically shows um, sort of our historical GHG, um, our increases in GHG, and then the recent spike um, in greenhouse gas emissions um, over, the, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, so it's always helpful for me uh, to always get back to this, that there are a lot of benefits to, um, from wind energy, the economic development, the environmental ones, but this is sort of one of the more pressing ones, um, um, which is basically climate change. Um, this is another sort of key driver here in Massachusetts. Um, we have the fourth highest electricity prices in the country. Um, incredibly high. Um, only a handful of other states are, or, um, are in front of us. And it's, it's something that we've um, actively taken on as a challenge to reduce um, for a variety of reasons, to reduce the, the burden on um, ratepayers, but also um, to make Massachusetts more attractive um, for businesses. So there are a variety of ways in which we've, we've tried to tackle this. Um, wind energy is, is a critical one. Um, this also shows that um, our, our um, energy economy is also one of the most efficient. So we get the most um, for, our, um, for our consumption on a per um, energy unit basis. This is another graph that I think many of you are familiar with. This shows how difficult it is for us to predict energy prices in New England. Um, these are a series of different projections from the EIA, and you can see that they're all over the place. And you know, our heavy dependence on natural gas that's not indigenous to New England um, is, is the primary reason for this difficulty in predicting what our future energy costs are. Natural gas makes up um, the bulk of our energy supply up here, upwards of 40%, and then the remainder is primarily a mix of coal, oil, and then renewables makes about 5% currently. So this is the economic opportunity that we're looking at here. 11,000 people in the clean energy sector, which is a 65% increase from just the past four years. So this goes back to the um, tremendous amount of growth that I mentioned earlier. Lots of jobs in solar manufacturing installation. Energy efficiency is also playing a critical role in the growth of this sector here in Massachusetts. It's our lowest cost, uh, our, our low-hanging fruit when it comes to reducing our emissions. And then we also have a thriving um, clean energy sector that's being led by entrepreneurs um, uh, and other sort of well-established clean energy companies ranging from battery manufacturers like A123 to TPI Composites and uh, also um, entities like Nexamp that are installing uh, solar projects and energy efficiency across the Commonwealth. Now, this didn't all just happen by accident. Um, there was a lot of hard work that went into this. And I would say three years ago, we put together, um, we worked very closely with the legislature and other stakeholders to put together really sort of groundbreaking legislation that's put Massachusetts in the forefront nationally when it comes to clean energy. There's a Green Communities Act um, which really expanded energy efficiency delivery. It expanded our RPS. So our RPS now increases by 1% annually as opposed to half percent before. So next year it'll go up to six, the year after up to seven, and, and, you know, and, and, and continue on into the near future. We expanded our net metering provisions, so that makes it much easier for um, renewable energy generation behind the meter to be financially sort of viable. 
Um, we established a green communities program, which is really focused on providing technical expertise to municipalities across the Commonwealth. Um, and we found a tremendous interest um, from municipalities like Hull and others in, 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 um, in uh, excuse me, in investing in clean energy as a way of um, having fixed energy prices and energy security. We also um, put in a long-term contract uh, requirement that requires the utilities to issue at least two RFPs um, within five years for long-term contracts. And uh, the DPU is actually reviewing the first batch of these um, long-term contract uh, responses now. And we expect that to be public very shortly. And then the other three pieces of legislation have also been critical in terms of providing incentives for municipalities and the private sector to invest in clean energy. The Global Warming Solutions Act, we have the most sort of um, aggressive um, GHG reduction um, targets in the country. Um, the Oceans Management Act, which basically lays out a zoning plan for state waters, which includes renewables and offshore wind. And then lastly, we have the Clean Energy Biofuels Act, which was a mandate for advanced biofuels. So really just a, a comprehensive swath of legislation that's really had tremendous effects, as you can see in this uh, chart here. <clears throat> Wind, this is a, showing the RPS class one technology trend in New England. Wind has really um, skyrocketed from, especially in the last four years, to being one of the leading um, RPS eligible sources of uh, technology in New England. So just a quick snapshot on global trends in wind energy. Um, globally, we're, um, the majority of growth we've seen here is in Asia. Our capacity increased by 22% last year. Um, 194.4 gigawatts we have installed globally. Um, and you can see here, uh, China in particular has really um, become a significant competitor with the United States, both in terms of installed capacity, but also in terms of the supply chain and the industries that are producing the turbines, the nacelles, the components. So this is, this is something we've, we've been keeping our eye on. This is also another snapshot that shows the rapid growth in Massachusetts. So, Four years ago, you had a handful of turbines, um, two of them in Hull, and uh, about three megawatts installed. In the last four years, we've seen almost 30-fold growth. So by the end of this year, we expect to be at 90 megawatts um, of installed capacity. We're currently second in New England for installed wind energy capacity. We, um, we host, uh, will host the first, or we currently host the first onshore wind farm, the Berkshire Wind Project, which was installed uh, last, uh, last week. Um, and then you can see here, one of the drivers for our interest in wind energy is our tremendous wind energy potential. We've got 1,500 megawatts of potential onshore and over 6 gigawatts of potential um, offshore. Just a tremendous potential to, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. As I mentioned earlier, just a brief list here of all of the really dynamic, um, thriving wind energy companies that we have based here, here in Massachusetts. Um, some snapshots there of the Wind Technology Test Center, which will be celebrating the ribbon cutting for next week. Um, next generation wind turbine up there from Flow Design. Um, we've also invested a lot in the infrastructure that'll be necessary for the deployment of offshore wind projects. So this is a rendering of the New Bedford port, which um, we've, in, we've invested significant resource, resources into to serve projects like Cape Wind and also other offshore wind projects that we expect will be installed off of our shores in the next few years. Snapshot of where our resources are and all of the, uh, the tremendous growth we've seen in terms of wind energy projects. And this is really, in many ways, Hull is where it really all started. New England has a rich history in wind energy dating back to turn of the century, but Hull is really the place where the first utility scale turbine in Mass was installed uh, 10 years ago. And you can see here it's been, the production has been great. Um, on, an average, on an annual average basis, enough electricity approximately to fuel 200 plus homes monthly, good capacity factor. And again, it really comes back to this issue of energy independence um, for municipalities and also fixed energy costs so that they're not at the whim of these fluctuating natural gas and other imported fossil fuel costs. So we've gone from having two or three projects like this to Berkshire Wind, which we celebrated the ribbon cutting for last week with, with the governor and some of my other colleagues here in state um, in the EEA. This is the largest wind farm in Massachusetts history, our first. And you can see here, it'll produce enough electricity to power more than 10% of all the households in Berkshire County with significant GHG reductions, 612,000 metric tons 
um, and it'll produce revenue for both the towns of Lanesboro and Hancock, which are hosting this project out in Western Mass. So this is really a great success story. Here's some images here of the project actually being installed, and um, it's actually online. So this brings us to 38 megawatts of wind energy installed in Massachusetts. Just wanted to very quickly go over some of the regional activity. Some of you may be familiar with the, um, the news report that ISO released in December. That also sort of backs up um, what our, the Patrick administration has sort of built up upon, which is, you know, Massachusetts and New England in general can really meet a significant percentage of its, uh, of its renewable, of its electricity generation from wind energy. You can see here 24% of our energy needs by 2020 can come from, from wind without radical or super expensive upgrades to the grid. Sometimes, you know, you hear from critics, oh, you know, the wind energy will, it'll take tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade our grid. This new support basically says, look, we can get, you know, 12 gigawatts of wind energy online in New England in the next 10 years without sort of completely changing our, our delivery infrastructure. So you can see here, this is a snapshot of proposed resource development in Massachusetts. Um, what's currently in the queue, 25% from onshore, offshore wind. And this also shows out of the renewable energy projects that are currently in the ISO queue, um, we have the overwhelming majority, 85%, is wind. Here's another snapshot. Most of this is in Maine, but the second largest chunk is from Massachusetts, and much of that is also offshore wind as well. So I'll, um, I'll start to wrap up. Here we have some of the wind energy initiatives that I had alluded to before that we've put in place to really sort of catalyze some of the potential that we've seen here in Massachusetts. Everything from the governor's wind energy goals to the expanded renewable portfolio standard, long-term contracts RFPs, and, and some of these other initiatives below. We've also put a strong focus on public outreach and awareness. Um, it's funny, the growth has been so rapid in many cases that um, there's been sort of a gap between folks who are sort of well-informed about wind energy and really pushing the envelope and the public in general. So we've seen a slight disconnect, and we've invested a lot of sort of resources and time into trying to educate municipalities, decision makers, and others about wind energy. And several of, several of you in this room have been actively involved with that as well. So these are some of the folks who've been really sort of putting together the workshops, the conferences, and other events where we can have a dialogue about the future of wind energy in Massachusetts. Just a few bullets on some of the benefits of uh, the 2,000 megawatts goal. It'll provide enough power for 800,000 homes, create hundreds of local jobs um, in revenue for municipalities, meet 10% of our state's electricity needs, and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 12%. Another big piece of legislation we've been pushing is the Wind Energy Siting Reform Act. It passed both chambers of the legislation last year, but it wasn't enacted. It's been refiled in the same form as last year. We're very optimistic this will pass. In a nutshell, this will completely improve and make our permitting um, regime for wind energy in Massachusetts much more efficient. So projects like Berkshire Wind and Hoosac and other large-scale projects, which have gone through 9 to 12-year development cycles, which is really just unsustainable for, from a financing perspective, with this Wind Energy Siting Reform Act, we anticipate we could reduce that down to a year or two. Also, the long-term contracts piece is also another piece that we focused on significantly. We received a lot of feedback from developers that the long-term contracts provides a very helpful sort of um, guarantee from a financing perspective. If a customer can lock into a 10 or 15-year long-term contract, it makes it much easier for a developer to secure financing. Very quickly, net metering, as I mentioned earlier, we've, these are some of the changes that we installed last year into net metering. So we've created two separate caps for private and public. Um, we've also created a new definition for a public net metering facility, and we've aggregated the cap for public entities up to 10 megawatts. So this will make it much easier for public um, municipalities in particular to develop more of these net metering projects that they can use at their wastewater treatment plants or other facilities and municipalities that have a significant amount of load, it could benefit from large-scale renewable energy projects like wind or solar. And we've also led a significant initiative to improve the interconnection process. We've heard from many developers 
that both at the distribution scale and also at the regional scale with ISO, that interconnection has been a, a bit of a barrier for development as well. So I'll end with this. Um, we've got lots of resources at, at your disposal, everything from the Clean Energy Center that provides um, um, incentives in the form of grants and technical assistance to towns, to the Green Communities Program through DOER, and we also have our Mass GIS Wind Viewer, which is also a great tool for municipalities to use in terms of finding um, locations that are appropriate for wind energy. But in a nutshell, Patrick administration continues to be very committed um, to wind energy. It'll be a significant part of our clean energy future. And I'm really thrilled that all of you will continue to be working with us to get this uh, moving forward. Thank you. Great, great. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule. Uh, and we have time for a few questions for Stephen. Is the wireless working? It is. So did, any questions uh, from the audience? State policies? All right, well, let's uh, thank Stephen once again. And uh, technology thanks. You summed it all up really well. Yeah. Great. Uh, Steve? Can I have uh, my panelists come up front, please? And I'll stop All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Connors from the MIT Energy Initiative. Uh, I, uh, as you'll hear from me later today, uh, I do research on how uh, uh, renewables and efficiency and general transformation of the energy sector uh, fit together. Um, I am uh, somewhat of an expert on wind, but I didn't do that at MIT. That's but the benefit of being a graduate of the UMass. Uh, 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 wind group uh, back in the mid uh, '80s, and I and that that got me into MIT. So that's how good it is, guys. You know, so that's all there is to it. Um, and uh, I've worked uh, on and off uh, with my friends at UMass, including Jim Manuel. You'll you'll hear later uh, today. Um, and uh, we did some pilot projects uh, for for uh, Hull. And uh, again, I'll talk about that later today, looking at sort of the timing of the wind in Hull and how that. Uh, comes back to the cost effectiveness and emissions effectiveness of uh, wind in general, but also uh, wind in hull. Um, we're going to kick off uh, this morning, uh, this morning's panel with uh, uh, technology, and that'll set us up for the, the 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 panels on construction, permitting, financing, and other topics later on. And we've got uh, three great panelists. Let me briefly introduce them. Then I'm going to have them talk for about ten minutes each. And then, uh, with luck, we'll have time for a little bit of Q&A. And if we don't have enough time, then we got the rest of the day to track these guys down and ask them what they're really up to. Um, first is Thomas Moston, who's the uh, head of uh, the uh, US uh, Offshore Wind America subsidiary of Siemens Energy. And uh, as, uh, you're, as uh, most of you know, uh, he's based in New Bedford. And that's where they're going to uh, uh, do the uh, final construction and uh, ins installation of the, the Cape Wind stuff, so I'm looking forward to hearing what he says about that. Then we're going to be followed by uh, Rahul uh, Yarella, who's uh, the executive director of our new um, wind technology testing center, the uh, new uh, large-scale offshore blade test facility uh, in Boston Harbor. And then we'll be followed by Bob Frick at, uh, at uh, GE Energy, and, and Bob uh, is uh, plays a critical role um, in selling these things up and down the uh, East Coast, including New England. So that's our our three technology panelists. I'll just put one little more uh, bit of historical context before I, I invite Tom up to uh, speak, and that is uh, yesterday, um, essentially the ISO New England approved shutting down two 60-year-old coal plants on the North Shore. Uh, uh, built in 52, uh, Salem Harbor 1 and 2 came in online in 52, 80 megawatt units. And it's just uh, very interesting the next day to be talking about um, offshore wind here on the south shore. And so that uh, tells you that the ball does move forward, uh, hopefully uh, uh, quicker and quicker. Um, so uh, let me wrap up there and uh, invite Tom Thomas up to uh, talk uh, uh, about uh, what he's been doing in Siemens. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank, of course, uh, for the opportunity to tell a little bit about Siemens and our products, and also some of the hurdles that we see in the offshore market uh, here in the US. I will see if I can get this thing to work. First, very quickly, uh, 
we are we are a small part of Siemens. Siemens right now is, is three sectors: industry, healthcare, and energy. And we are of course part of the energy sector and a part of the renewable uh, energy group. I will not spend more time on that. We are about uh, sixty thousand people in the U.S. This is where we're located regarding offshore wind. Uh, we have started up an office last year in in Boston. It's actually in the city. It's right. We will do some uh, pre-construction regarding the Cape Wind project in New Bedford for the for the office itself is is in the city. Then I'll talk a little bit about the trends that we see in the turbine technology, and then afterwards I'll talk a little bit about the trend we see say for what we call the balance of plant part, the vessels, the ports, and so on. First of all, onshore, you can say now the rotor size, the turbine size, have kind of reached the limit for what you can transport on the roads. So there we do not see a big development, at least size-wise, in the future. But offshore, we have still haven't seen the, say, the limiting factor for the turbine size. So we are still seeing the trend that uh, the rotors are getting bigger, and therefore we need a bigger hub height, so the towers are getting taller. And it's also a trend that is needed because the projects are going further and further offshore, so thereby the infrastructure cost is going up. So basically you need bigger units to put on top to make the financing uh, come together. Some of the other uh, things that we've been working on regarding rotors and so on is, is uh, what you see on the upper right corner. I don't know if this one has kind of a laser beam. But the nice picture in the corner there, that is actually more for the northern part of the United States and Canada, where we have included, you can say, heating elements in the rotor to de-ice the rotor to make sure that we can also install turbines in the Great Lakes and in the, in the waters outside Canada. Again, one of the trends is to increase the availability because that's what's, again, driving the financing one of the ways we've been doing this successfully the last 20 years is to have a uh, what we call a turbine condition monitoring system. So basically you, you monitor the vibration of the different components in a turbine, then that kind of give a fingerprint of how the turbine should run when it's new and, and not broken at all. And then basically if something happens to the system, then those vibrations will change, and we'll get an, a warning in our system and we'll be able to go out before the turbine breaks down to fix it again, to uh, increase the availability. Uh, for our newest turbine, which is the 3.6 uh, megawatt turbine, or the biggest turbine we have right now, we've had three issues with that for, for gearboxes at the same time for the first project we installed back in yeah, five, six years ago. And those were all discovered by this system uh, before it made any severe damage. This is the newest turbine technology we have developed. Uh, many of you have probably heard about gearboxes in turbines breaking down, and this is not a big issue again for onshore wind because there you have the accessibility to go to the turbines quite easy, look what is the issue, and fix it with a mobile crane if needed. But offshore, that cost is, is tremendous. So offshore, uh, we would like to get rid of the gearbox basically, at least when we get further offshore. So we developed a, a direct drive technology. We've been working on that for 10 years, and a prototype came out, or two prototypes came out in 2008 with the 3.6 I just mentioned before. So that was kind of a known turbine that we converted to get some information about it. And based on that, we actually developed the, we say, uh, commercial available direct drive turbine, the 3.0, and that's available now. That turbine is designed for onshore, again, so that is to make sure they can travel on roads, so it's it's compact. Uh, other advantages, of course, is that there is no gearbox, so there's less moving parts, thereby higher reliability, higher availability, also because there's less parts in general. So if you have the part list of the turbines, then that's basically reduced to half the number of parts in the turbine, which makes maintenance lots easier, faster, and cheaper. Then the big brother to that one will be coming out as a prototype this year. It's a six megawatt turbine. Uh, it will be designed uh, specifically for offshore in contrary to the 3.0. So it will be big at least. So it will be room to do 
part of the maintenance inside without having to take everything apart. But besides from that, it will be designed on the same principles as you see here, uh, less parts in general, and based on the same uh, generator technology. Then some words about the better supply part foundations. I know the next one will probably, next section will probably talk more about foundations. But at least seen from our perspective, then you have uh, gravity foundations and monopiles. Basically, when the industry started in uh, 1991, what, it was very near shore projects in, in Scandinavia. And then the gravity based foundation were the easier solution because that was kind of what you used onshore. You just build it and then put it on a barge and shipped it offshore. And that was fine because then the turbine would see the same loading as it would onshore, so you didn't have to invent the wheel, you can say. But if you went more offshore to about more than 10 meters, I would say 30 feet, then the system got too expensive and we needed another system. Then we invented the monopile, which is basically just a tube like the tower that you hammer down in the seabed, so you clamp it in the seabed. And that was cheaper for installation and uh, production. The issue there is if you get to very deep water, then the tube gets very long, of course, and then the frequency of the whole system gets low. And then the frequency gets low to the rotor frequency, which increases the loads. So to avoid that with the project that we're seeing right now, because now we're going up to even projects around 60 meter, then people have been looking at the jacket solution that the uh, US has also been using for oil and gas platforms for many years. And that can get, there you can get the stiffness that you want, basically, at a lower cost and with using less steel. The only problem right now, as we see it, some of the panelists in the next might disagree, but it, it is not yet industrialized and proven technology, at least not for the dynamic loads of a turbine. So there has been installed a few jackets, but in general, I would say 99% of the turbines installed offshore so far has been monopiles or gravity. The last one is floating turbines. I have an example of that. Siemens has, together with Statoil Hydro, installed a floating turbine in Norway on uh, 200 meters of water. And that's a spa design, so basically just a tube, again going down, floating, and that spa is about 100 meters below the, the water. That project was a test case to figure out how the turbine would react to these big movements. Uh, and we had some issues figuring out how to change the control system so the turbine didn't think it was falling down, but just realized that it was actually bouncing. Uh, in the wind. So that's been running now for close to yeah one and a half years, something like that. Uh, and that project was not commercial uh, compatible, I would say, far from it. Uh, the foundation there weighed about 2,000 ton, so that's a lot of money, of course. Right now, uh, some uh, companies are looking at an optimized solution where it doesn't have to be 100 meter long, and actually where the wall thickness is very thin compared to a traditional monopile, because the monopile is cli clamped in the seabed, so you need a big wall of steel to take those loadings. But here you have a floating thing, like a box that can bounce off, so you don't get the big loads. So it, so it must, of course, be longer, but then the wall thickness is thinner, so the overall cost of steel would be fairly the same. At least that's the idea. It's not ready yet, but they, they'll get there within the next five years, probably. Uh, vessels, again, uh, the nearshore vessels and uh, nearshore projects in Scandinavia was built on a simple barge. You just dragged out, waited when the weather was nice because you only had to install two turbines. Uh, now we're looking at projects like the Cape Wind for 100 plus turbines, so you need to install all year round. To do that in the winter season, you need big vessels that can jack out of the water to avoid the waves. And you need cranes on the vessel that can lift not only one part of the one component of the turbine, but maybe some of the components that are joined, uh, to decrease the installation time. And the last requirement for the new vessels we've seen is one of, one of the many of the vessels in Europe has been what we've called multi-purpose vessels, where people develop the vessels to do wind offshore in the summertime and then do container shipments in the wintertime, kind of. Well, that ended up being what we call non-purpose vessels, at least we joke about it that way, uh, because they, they were really not good at anything at the end. So the vessels that are coming out now, this year and the next couple of years, in Europe at least, is very specific built for offshore wind. Some of the tasks for, uh, 
for the US market is of course that we have the Jones Act in the US, so those vessels cannot be brought uh, to the US coast. So basically that needs to be figured out how to do that. Uh, for some of the first projects we're looking at maybe getting a waiver for that, uh, maybe using barge to sail out to the vessel. Uh, and also Siemens owns 49% of a big uh, the biggest installation company in Europe, A to C, and we are uh, getting them to team up with US suppliers and uh, settle down in, uh, in Massachusetts as well. Last thing is the ports. Uh, we've also been working closely with some of the ports on the East Coast, specifically uh, to make sure that it's fit for offshore wind. Uh, basically, we need access 24 hours uh, all year round. We need to make sure that the, the area is sufficient for storing the turbine because we need a buffer to make sure we're not depending on uh, barges coming up for, for all the US ports or from Europe. And yeah, basically you need the right water depth and you need a, a sufficient bearing capacity to install the component at the key site. That was my pre short presentation. I hope I stayed within the 10 minutes at least, something like that. <laughs> Is it questions now or questions afterwards? I mean, I'll hold questions till the end. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Rahul? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Town of Hall and Andy, for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm part of the Wind Technology Testing Center. You see a picture of this up here. This is the world's largest structural testing lab. It's going to open next week with the first test. Partly funded. Um, Back in 2007, Governor uh, Patrick's leadership, state's wind team, University of Massachusetts, all teamed up and won a competitive sol solicitation to build a large blade testing center on um, deep water port. The reason, offshore wind. Like you heard, onshore wind, the blade lengths are about 50 meters. That's the maximum probably you can uh, transport on the road. Larger blades have to be transported by water, so we had to have a deep water port. Before I get into the details of the lab and what we do, I just wanted to talk, uh, take a couple minutes about why offshore wind. This is a perfect location. You know, we have the resource, the energy is there. We need to cost competitively harness it. The other big thing about offshore wind is it's near the load uh, centers. If you look at the population centers, there's a map uh, in Android report that overlays population centers, and you'll see offshore wind is right next to the load centers. And that's a big advantage. Greenhouse gas emissions, you heard about it. Another point a lot of people don't mention about wind and offshore wind, very minimal water usage. A lot of other sources of uh, electricity generation use water, and water is a scarce resource too energy independence, local jobs. Compared to onshore wind, advantages of offshore wind, higher capacity factors, higher wind speeds, lower shear and turbulence. Turbines can spin at um, higher tip speeds or they can spin faster. All of this amounts to more energy production. So initially there's probably slightly higher costs for um, you know, tech, uh, technology reasons for foundations, turbines have to be corrosion resistant, but you can get more energy out of offshore wind turbines. Wanted to show this, you may have seen this before. In offshore wind, why larger turbines? You hear, you hear Siemens, GE, everybody wants larger turbines. And the reason is the turbine cost may be slightly higher with larger turbines, but the total cost install and uh, commission is reduced by using less larger turbines. In offshore wind, turbine is about 30 percent. Onshore it's 50 to 60 percent is the turbine cost. So it makes sense to have larger turbines. There's probably a point at which it doesn't make sense, but that's probably 10, 15 megawatts. We have long ways before we get there. 
Some of the technical challenges and opportunities as we develop offshore turbines, rotor blade structures, that's the lab we built in um, Charlestown. New materials, carbon fiber will lead to um, lighter, more efficient and longer blades. Multi-piece blades. There is a constraint if the blade is in one piece to transport it, but you can develop blades in two or three pieces and attach them at um, on site. Larger cards, better airfoil design. So there's a lot of opportunity to improve and capture more energy and make it cost uh, more cost competitive. Another area where there needs to be more research and some research is happening is new towers. Why steel? Composite material is better for offshore because it's corrosion resistant, lighter. So um, there needs to be some work on new tower concepts. Foundations, I'm not, I put up a picture, you hear all the other companies talk about foundations. That's an area where there's a lot of research already um, going on. But the turbine tower is an area where there's a lot of cost and improvements can be made. Drive trains, you hear a lot of companies going towards direct drive. Main idea is less moving parts, more reliability. Corrosion protection is a challenge. Are the nacelles sealed cost, effectly, uh, cost effectively, effectively uh, providing corrosion resistance is important long term. Couple things I think which probably are more important to the town of Hall. Like there's an area for onshore wind for 20, 25 years now at uh, Andrell facility in Colorado to take an onshore turbine, install it for testing purposes I think there needs to be a platform where uh, new offshore turbines can be installed and tested. It's important to do the testing, make sure the reliability is there, uh, you know, take the right steps and not install the turbines and have issues. I think that's bad for the community outreach. It's, it's uh, better to do it the right way. And that requires, in my, from a technical standpoint, of prototype staging or a platform. Another important thing is the wind data. The mesoscale predictions are pretty accurate and they have been correlated with onshore, but I think offshore it's harder to put up med towers, much more costly. So the newer technology has to be promoted and um, I hope the commercial side of the industry promotes that so we can have more site-specific data compared to the mesoscale um, models and get a better assessment of the offshore wind data. More specifically, jumping into the project I was talking about in Charlestown to test large structures, specifically blades. Blades have to be tested more. More rigorous testing is required to improve reliability also to make them more efficient, bring in new materials, new structural shapes. New IEC standards are requiring companies uh, do full-scale testing. Are requiring full-scale testing. In the past, lack of testing facilities or infrastructure led companies to produce uh, turbine blades and install turbines without you know, full testing for three to six months. And that led to blade failures, not because of major design problems, but quality issues and simple things that could have been solved. And that's a black eye on the industry, it's bad for everybody. A testing infrastructure like this will help a lot. What we do in the lab, we bring in large structures we're opening next week with our first test. The lab is 300 feet long, 80 feet tall, 150 feet wide, clear span. And what we can do is test up to 90 meter blade, probably up to 100 meters blade. And we can uh, apply hydraulically apply forces up to 84 mega Newton meters. That's a lot of force. And bend the blades with uh, hydraulic actuators, it's the latest technology to apply the bending movement to the blade. 
and the bottom line about this is we can test the materials, we can test the blade shapes, see where it's over designed and see where it needs um, more reinforcing. And on the bottom left hand side you'll see the actual picture of the facility. And here's a better picture of what we do. This is the only lab in the world where we can test the blades vertically and horizontally. Each has its own advantages. One is uh, based on gravity and so we're the only lab we can do both ways for our clients. We can do static test, which is based uh, ultimate strength and fatigue test, which is accelerated life testing to make sure that the blade has the 20 year life it should. And here's the building. Um, this is not a rendering, this is the actual building. We're gonna open next week. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Bob Frick from GE, and I'm here today to talk about uh, our offshore wind product, referred to as the 4.1113. Just to make sense of those numbers, our naming convention is the nameplate rating, the 4.1 megawatt machine, and 113 is the swept diameter of the rotor. So, if you notice, one of the things we put up here is uh, offshore power that you can bank on. And that is a key part of where we see the industry going. It really has to be, for this to go large scale, it needs project financing. And it really needs to be bankable, and you have to attract the billions that are necessary uh, to implement this. And I have to figure this out, let me see. Which button, Tom? Oh, wait there. Okay, good. One of the things I just want to start out with is who are we? Uh, we're GE, General Electric, founded by Thomas Edison 140 some years ago, and we've been in ever since he founded the power business, uh, and that's what we are in today, and uh, we're in a big player in the renewable space. Uh, GE Power Generation uh, Equipment, we're a global company, and uh, 25% of the world's power generation comes from a, G, a piece of GE equipment, be it steam turbines, gas turbines, solar, renewables. If you, just to ground you about the scale that we're in, um, this shows you, this bar chart shows you from 2003 to 2009, the GE installed base in gigawatts. So in 2009, I didn't update it for 2010, but in 2009 we're at 20 gigawatts. So you can really think about, in wind, uh, about 20 nuclear plants that we didn't have to be built because of the, of the, uh, of the wind, uh, our wind fleet out there. I think our keys to success have been, uh, we focus on customers, that's, uh, you know, that's in all our product lines. Uh, we really like to have technology, technology differentiation, and you're gonna see that in our 4.1 machine, I think, as I explained to you what makes it different. Uh, we were very good, whether it be locomotives, uh, uh, airplane engines, wind turbines, we really have the supply chain, the global supply chain uh, figured out, and uh, we think that's one of our strengths. And uh, really, it, it, you have to come down and execute flawlessly each and every time. Real quick on just the portfolio, you'll see basically five segments in our renewable portfolio. We, the first two are onshore, product line, our 1.5 megawatt and our 2.5, we call it the 1X and the 2X product lines. Between the two of them, we have close to 16,000 machines deployed throughout the world uh, right now. Um, offshore, that's a picture of our 3.6 megawatt machine in Arclo, and I'm gonna talk, Arclo is a project off the coast of Ireland. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Arclo uh, in greater in depth. And then we have our solar and our services business. Interesting on solar, we just announced we're building a 600 megawatt facility here in the UN United States. Uh, thin film, uh, we've reached and been certified by NREL as basically a world record in thin film efficiency of 13%, and it's just gonna go up from there. You know, we have results in the laboratory that's really gonna help move solar efficiency forward. 
I talked about this big fleet of uh, turbines that we have out there, and I'll talk a little bit about, we call it the world's, I know it's a claim, but the world's best running fleet. And I think these numbers help back me up. If you, if you look at, there, these are model year of turbines by operating year. You can see our fleet right now of XLs globally are running about 98.5% availability. That's, that's really industry leading. And I like this chart because even though I want to get you to that 98.5% number, what it really says, if you bought a turbine in 2006, you might have only had 95% availability. But we don't, we don't stop there. We really work to get each and every turbine up to its maximum availability, not just this year's current product. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move into our offshore space now because I, I know that's the, the interest today. And we have, we, I've mentioned this project, um, Arclo, and there's seven units are operating off the coast of Ireland. We were the first to go offshore. Uh, we designed the turbine, we designed the project, we manufactured, we installed, we owned, and we operate those units to today. We've learned an awful lot in the last five years about how to do offshore. We call it the University of Arklo. There are a lot of lessons learned, and we pulled back from the offshore space for a number of years. We, we took back. Cape Wind, when it was originally proposed and carried forward, was carrying the GE 3.6. We backed away from that based on the lessons we learned at Arklo. And the key lesson I think you, you learn is it's not like onshore. You can't get in a pickup truck and pull up next to the wind turbine. You really have to have, you have to take that reliability and availability to a whole nother level to go offshore. And the way we do that is not taking an onshore turbine and trying to marinize it and bring it offshore. We learned that that was our 3.6. It was a scaled version of our 1.5 product line, scaled to bring it offshore. And we learned there that that's not the way to do it. You really have to take a clean sheet of paper and design. And the key, if you know onshore wind, the, the most stressed part, the stress component is the gearbox. We learned that you really have to avoid, and you've heard talk about direct drive. We really think that is the key for offshore, one of the key design elements. You have to go direct drive. Uh, the risk out there, it's much riskier than doing onshore. We, we, you know, quantified about five times the risk, but the rewards out there, great wind, scale, and that's important on wind. Uh, you, have to you have to solve the, the access problems. Um, and cranes, you really wanna avoid the use of having to bring a crane back for maintenance. It's about 30 times the cost of onshore to replace, say, a gearbox. So this is our this is our machine. This is a, a you know a concept, an artist's conception of it. But it's and I'm going to show you the actual machines. What you notice here is it's different than most wind turbines you've seen. It has no gearbox in the middle. There's space. Uh, it has a much different generator on the back. It's a permanent magnet generator, and other things that really jump out. Um, on onshore, you go out of the Nixel to get into the rotating hub. There are a lot of electronics up for pitch control up in the, the hub. For We've learned that you don't want to go outside external to the nacelle offshore. So you can access the hub from within the nacelle. Nacelle is actually is, is sealed, uh, pressurized, and oh, obviously salt corrosion is a, is a major uh, element. Redundancy. Uh, you can't afford to have a transistor or, you know, something on a circuit board blow out there and have to go out to replace, you know, something smaller than a fingernail. You really have to bring the reliability and availability levels up. Um, every, almost every component in that machine can be lowered out of the nacelle without the use of a crane. Now you can disassemble that, that uh, generator and bring down piece by piece if you need to replace a piece of the generator. Other things. Key to this design and key to our design is there's a two bearing design. That shaft in the middle is balanced. You have a hub on one side and then you have the generator hanging off the back side and those two bearings. A lot of wind turbines onshore are one bearing design. This is two bearing to really, to, to really provide that stability out there and the balance. Um, 
we really think, if you start looking at what, what space we designed for with this machine, we really think this is a, is a great monopile machine. Um, uh, we see about 5% uh, improvement over a lot of what we're seeing on the offshore market, 5% uh, uh, output improvement, um, with, if you factor in the you know, available capacity factors. Um, it's very, very quick to install. We learned that it's very expensive to be offshore. You just go out, it's plug and play. You put it on top of the tower, you drop the cables, everything's up tower, everything's been tested in the factory. Um, again, I mentioned the direct drive. Direct drives eliminate all the oil in the gearbox. Um, I think I have a number up here. Uh, uh, 1.2 million for a gigawatt, you, you're basically removing 1.2 million uh, liters of oil that need to be out in that, in that large wind farm and need to be replaced every year or two. That's not, not, not here. And I'm running a little bit over time, so I'll move forward. One of the things, what you see in the background here, these are the, our, our prototype units up in Norway. Uh, the 3.0 megawatt uh, direct drive machines and the 3.5. We have uh, 12 direct drive machines installed. Some of them have been operating since 2004. Um, that's the GE approach to these things. You take them, you prove them, then you scale them. And we're scaling it up to the 4.1 megawatt machine, which will be deployed later this year. We have 50 years of uh, equivalent runtime on, uh, on those 12 machines. So we have the arc low. Uh, units, we have the, this new design, and we also, it's funny, uh, over in Europe, someone took our 1.5s onshore and put them offshore, but we weren't thrilled about that, but it turns out they're performing fairly well. Uh, a little bit more uh, concept of, you see the balance in this, the heavy front, the heavy back, the two bearing system in the middle. It's, it turns out it's not that heavy, it's about 280 uh, tons in the cell, which is relatively light compared to some of the, the machines going off. Sure. I think you've seen uh, the, these charts. Uh, absolutely. Offshore is near the load centers. You're fortunate enough to be in a great, great spot in the country for good offshore wind. I know this is an eye test, but, uh, eye test, but just this is, we do evaluations of states. This GE has a big marketing, and we rank all the states by our criteria, what we think are well positioned for offshore wind. This is it. And trust me, you can't read it, but the one on the far, far left is Massachusetts. We really think you have the key ingredients here, the policies, the ports, all the right pieces. So that's it. Uh, I'll wrap up here. Um, we're, we're back into the offshore wind space. We're back in big. We're back to stay. And we look forward to uh, doing projects here in New England. Thank you. For any questions? Sure do. All right. Um, quick summary is uh, bigger is better. Uh, direct is better. Um, uh, let's uh, take some uh, questions uh, from the audience. Yes, sir. Way back there. Name is Malcolm Brown. I had heard that rare earth metals are key to keeping your permanent magnets active and that China controls 97% of the world market of rare earth metals. Is that a problem? Uh, okay, so question about how rare are rare earth metals? Um, Thomas? Okay, have a good one. I'm trying to speak loud. Can you hear me in the back? Should I walk up here? Okay. Uh, it is true, uh, when we started the uh, we say the technology 10 years ago, that, that was a concern also price-wise. Uh, since we've been developing the technology, then the price has dropped even by, by 80%. And also we have uh, found other sources than, than, than Chinese sources uh, in Australia, and has been mentioned, uh, sources in, the, in Russia as well. Uh, and even if, even if it will be an issue uh, supply chain-wise, then we have a yeah. Then we have a backup solution to that, which I, of course can come into. But we don't see that as a big issue at the moment, due to the lower cost and due to the uh, bigger availability of sources outside China as well. Yeah, 
Uh, I echo what Tom said. Um, we've been working with permanent magnets for dozens of years. We employ them in a lot of our land-based generation, not non-wind, you know, the thermal business. And we're bringing them into the wind business. More on the technology front about permanent magnets, certainly the availability of them. And we recognize that uh, in the limited source, geographic sources, and we're working, we, we have plans around that. Uh, one th interesting thing about permanent magnets, uh, they're fickle. Uh, you really have to do them right. They're very temp temperature sensitive. We've been through for the scan, for the, the, the offshore turbine, I call it the scan wind, we had purchased when we, we had purchased that technology from a company called Scandinavia Wind. They had been through four, we have on generation four of the generator design, really optimizing and perfecting the, the permanent magnet, the air gaps, uh, the temperature control. Temperature control is key, so you don't get degradation over the 20 years design life of the turbine. And we think we have that solved. Thank you. Additional questions, sir? How are the, uh, those legs that are, have multiple segments, how are they attached to each other? What's the process? There's no blades in production. There are multiple section now. Not yet. But it would be T-bolts like how the blade mounts to the hub. The, the how the root of the blade today, the root of the blade has T-bolts when it's bolted onto the hub. Yes. Through a bearing, it's similar bolted joint is envisioned. But there is no multiple piece blades in production today. Isn't there a lot of stress where each segment theory, but yes. would be attached, and are two bolts sufficient, or would it be... Oh, it, it will have to be multiple. It will have to be a circle, okay. a multiple of them. But uh, the, to build on that is how, how sophisticated are the blades going? Because there's a lot of blade management down to the tip now, isn't there, in terms yep. of stress monitoring and... And, and there's uh, special sensors. And we so just heard from, from Thomas uh, heating elements for, for, for icing situations. There's a lot of uh, condition-based monitoring, so you constantly know the strain and the loading on the blade. But it's still a challenge because it's outboard and you have no easy access to torque back the bolts for lack of a better word. So it has to work. Once it's installed, it has to be there for 20 years. Thank you. All right, another question back here, sir. So I, th I think we're going to get into the, the, the jobs potential throughout the course of the day. Um, uh, uh, do uh, any of our panelists want to take a crack at jobs in sort of the, the maintenance, uh, excuse me, jobs in, in, on, the, on the technology provision side? And if you have any numbers in, in sort of maintenance going forward? Right. Yeah, Oops. Lo local can, jobs per I, turbine I, installed. I can take a, take a crack at at least. Uh, We've just built out, I started the office, as I mentioned, a year ago, and then it was only me. Uh, and the plan is to build that up over the next year, so year and a half, to about 30 people. But the best, the best analogy I can do is to talk about how we did it for onshore wind. We started our onshore wind business, which is headquartered out of Orlando in 2004, with one guy. And now we have about more than 2,000 people working onshore wind in the U.S. Uh, and for that, you would say the more hardcore engineering, kind of high scale the jobs, it's probably around three, four hundred, and the rest is kind of servicing jobs. That's in the Commonwealth. No, no that's in the United States. But those are those those are the jobs within Siemens. Within Siemens, yeah. And then yeah. there's the multiplier of the construction guys, the operators. I don't, I don't have that number. It's it's, it's Siemens uh, employees only. Which I think you're, I think you're, you're asking a key question because it's, it's who's in the factories for wind turbines and the subsidiary components, and then you come to the construction jobs and then the, the, the wind farm operation and maintenance jobs. Rahul? I'll take a minute. I don't have numbers, but I want to point out there is a lot of local jobs. For example, the New Bedford Port. So even though some a lot of components are made outside, they have to be shipped and they have to be staged and assembled on the port near the project. 
So there's a lot of uh, high paying construction jobs. I, um, I can't comment on the numbers. And also we're attracting a lot of companies to start uh, design centers and branches here by leading the effort. And the state through the Clean Energy Center has a workforce development program too. So there's a lot of activity going on there. All right, well, let's uh, close this out. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and, and we invite discussions throughout the day. Tom's got a couple extra guys with him here today, uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to that. And uh, I'll pass it back to Andy. Great, great. Thanks, Ooh, we Steve. get hats. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Great, great, great. Thank you so much, thank Steve. You, that was great. Thanks. All right, folks, we're going we're gonna to take, uh, we're a little bit behind, but we're going to take a little 15-minute break. Before everyone gets up, can we let the high schoolers up back uh, make their way out? And, uh, and we're going to have some of the folks from the technology panel and, uh, and go down and, and work with those folks downstairs and get them some education. Um, and in the meantime, why don't we make it back here uh, about if we can get back here at 5 of 11 and get going on and underway, we'll be back on track. We're uh, flipping uh, construction and permitting. Permitting will be ne next. So thank you, folks, and we'll see you in. Hold on. It's only 1030, right? Yep. So 15 minute break or? 15, yeah. We'll be 1030, come back at 5 of 11 ish. 25 minute break. 1045. 1045. Uh, what did I say? 5 of 11? It's 1039. They're starting at 1045 without me. So uh, do, do, do make it back here on time, folks. Thanks. That you really don't want to miss. Um, we've got an incredible panel. Uh, and I do uh, permitting. I should introduce myself first. I'm a partner at Nixon Peabody in, in Boston. And I do a lot of renewable energy permitting work, um, particularly in, in wind and offshore wind. Uh, and I speak at and present and moderate at conferences all the time and I don't often get Bob and Jim and Steve and, and their caliber and their quality coming you know, directly from the agencies and directly from uh, a firm that has the, the expertise and experience, uh, particularly right here uh, in New England. So um, we are very lucky to have with us Bob LaBelle, um, who's from Bomer, formerly MMS. I have just realize I've gotten over the cusp. I don't call you MMS anymore. Um, but BOMER is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement within the US Department of Interior. Um, Bob came up from uh, DC. Uh, he's the Acting Associate Director for Offshore Energy. Um, and they are really, at this point, one of the integral links. Uh, uh, the, the, the agency is one of the integral links with respect to um, offshore permitting and leasing. Um, then we'll hear from Jim Haggerty. Jim is the uh, regulatory program manager for the North Atlantic Division of the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Jim came up from Brooklyn, um, and so we really thank him. I think I may win on uh, getting folks from the furthest away, although I don't know. Maybe we had some natives from Europe on the past, last panel, so I, I won't compete with that. Um, and then finally, Steve Wood um, from ESS. Um, ESS is uh, a, an environmental consulting firm. Uh, Steve is a vice president. He focuses on energy projects. Uh, Steve and I have had the pleasure of working together over many years, starting with fossils. Uh, remember those? Fossils? Yeah. And, uh, and now getting into some renewable energy. And Cape, uh, ESS was a uh, consultant on the Cape Wind Project, among others. Um, so the name may, may be familiar. So with that, Bob? I just mind the okay. boards. If you don't mind, I just would sure. rather just stand up here. Is that a bad thing? Because I have to be able to see my slides. So. I'm good. You could just slide it down. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I just need to be able to see the screen. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm fine. I won't go much farther than this. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Um, I've always wanted to come to Hull. I'm from Lowell, Mass, and um, it's great getting back to New England. But uh, this is the, the place where you people are actually doing what uh, everybody else is talking about. So uh, I feel a little, uh, some of the things I'm going to say you already know. And, uh, you know, this town is a leader in, in uh, showing how it can be done practically, safely, and effectively. So 
Um, I'm really happy to be here and, um, and I'm really interested in learning from you as much as I can try to tell you what's going on at the federal level. So um, I, I have a lot of writing on these slides. I'm not going to go through it in detail. It's, it's for your use after the presentation. Um, but I will touch on you know, the main things that are going on and, a, and I'll try to do it quickly. Um, oops, I just lost the... Okay, thanks. So yeah. to advance, it's just the right-hand side? Yeah, that's right at the left. Okay, got it. Um, as uh, we've heard, we used to be a minerals management service. Um, we're also uh, going, undergoing a reorganization within the long acronym name. Um, the renewable energy portion of the agency will be housed starting October 1 in a new bureau called Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM. So we'll have a shorter acronym. Um, and we're also responsible, of course, beyond renewable energy for offshore oil and gas. Uh, back in 2005, the Energy Policy Act uh, basically uh, gave us the authority to, uh, you know, uh, write regulations and, and oversee production, transportation, or transmission of energy from other sources than oil and gas. And um, we, we did, it took us a number of years to get the regulations in place, but we finally did that. And we are uh, happy to be moving ahead. I guess the main point of my presentation is that uh, the overall program philosophy is, is collaborate, uh, work with all partners. Uh, in fact, in that, in that law, one of the things that it specifies is, you know, you shall collaborate with all stakeholders, so industry, uh, environmental, local, state, other feds. And so we, we're doing that, tribes. Uh, we're, we're trying to uh, make sure that initiatives are, are based on, you know, the federal waters start three miles and out. So that's what we're talking about here, that those lands offshore for a wind energy. And also we have a smaller program on wave and, and marine current energy. But uh, we have, uh, as we'll see, uh, some agreements with other agencies to try to pave the way. And the focus is on multiple use out there. As you're well aware, um, anytime you want to put anything anywhere, there are people that may think it's not the best place where you're trying to put the uh, project. So uh, we're certainly working with all those constituents. The regulations can be found uh, you know, through our website. It, it starts from, uh, there's the coordination that I mentioned that, that's specified in the regs. Uh, through leasing of the offshore lands, site assessment, et cetera. Um, payments, plans, uh, how projects will be built and operated. All the way through to, uh, of course, the environmental and safety monitoring and inspections. And all the way through to specifying how uh, the equipment will be removed 25 years from now um, if it's no longer um, operational. And this is just a host of laws that uh, all of us have to uh, uh, comply with, um, everything from the National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, um, Archaeological Historical Preservation Act, Indian Sacred Sites, there's just so many of them. And it's a, it's a large effort to try to get, um, uh, you know, to meet all of these requirements, as you're all well aware, but it can be done. And our approach to getting all this done with regard to uh, getting a robust um, offshore wind uh, industry for the United States is to work uh, through intergovernmental task forces. You've seen several times now the, uh, the DOE chart that shows the, uh, the great offshore wind resources next to the population centers. And so those very uh, locations are where we're concentrating our efforts. And of course, New England is in the forefront of this. Um, and we have uh, these task forces where we uh, bring in all the affected state, local, tribal governments, and federal agencies. They're invited to participate. Um, this does not, by the way, replace the formal consultation that's required by the Endangered Species Act and, and, uh, and other acts like the Marine Mammal Protection Act. But it, it certainly provides a lot of good input and exchange of ideas and discussions uh, before any federal decisions are made. So it's, you know, it's a forum to educate each other about what's out there, um, 
uh, what, what each of the constituents is responsible for and, and concerned about. Um, there's a lot of good opportunities to exchange data on uh, biological and physical resources, for example. Um, and also just to continue the dialogue as the process moves ahead, as it is off Massachusetts, which I'll address here in a minute. So the bottom line here, the, the, the bottom bullet is the one I, I would like you to read. We actually consider the input in our decision making. and so. Um, that can be shown and manifested in how um, some of the offshore areas, uh, the proposed areas, will change in configuration before we actually uh, offer, it, offer it for leasing and development. So we have these task forces with the uh, nine to ten states up there that you can see, and uh, we expect Florida, Hawaii, and South Carolina shortly to join the hunt. Um, Oregon, the uh, task force is uh, on wave energy. That one just got underway. I think we've had one or two meetings. Um, lots of meetings already held uh, with Massachusetts and Rhode Island, not only for the Massachusetts area, but uh, also the, the joint area of interest between the states of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. There's a lot of work and negotiations uh, going along with that. Um, I mentioned that we're working with our fellow feds, so we have uh, MOU, Memorandums of Understanding, with uh, the Department of Energy. They're really good partners in all this. They're advancing uh, uh, the technical efforts and, and uh, looking ahead and, and um, sort of setting the stage to move the country forward and, and to uh, uh, enable the industry to move forward in an effective way. So we work very closely with DOE. Um, we also have an MOU. Uh, I worked on this one for a couple of years with the Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, um, basically meet the requirements of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act as we go ahead offshore here. Uh, we have one with the Coast Guard. We're working on one with uh, getting very close with NOAA, DOD, Corps of Engineers, and so um, and FERC. Um, I wanted to mention our, our research efforts. We have two studies uh, programs in our agency, the Environmental Studies Program and uh, the Technology Assessment and Research Program. So the first one does what it says. It looks into possible environmental impacts, gathering baseline data on species of concern uh, to include socioeconomic impacts. Um, and so we have got a, a good effort on that. We're always looking for partners to uh, to uh, increase the, the, the scientific knowledge behind the, the decisions. Um, the technology assessment and research effort is also uh, probably more in tune with some of the folks that are here today. Uh, we're doing things like, you know, we just had the National Academy do a, an assessment of the structural integrity of wind turbines and structures offshore. Uh, we've got uh, safety work there. We've got um, a lot of uh, technical engineering uh, efforts undergoing in, in that program. We work again with DOE and, and international partners to learn what we can and support their efforts with offshore renewables. And uh, again, we use that all the information. Um, you know, it's an applied research program. We won't fund anything unless there's a practical use of the uh, the information to help uh, with decision making. Marine spatial planning. I just wanted to touch on this. Uh, this is I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, uh, it was uh, mandated in the, uh, in the policy act I discussed earlier, and recently the president um, signed an executive order to implement it. We're working on that, um, and part of that is developing, uh, along with NOAA, we were charged to fund a development of basically an offshore GIS system that, that shows legal boundaries for everything from, you know, our leases to uh, whatever data we can get from the Coast Guard, uh, other users out there, DOD, the fishing industry. Um, and so there's a lot of overlaid layers that uh, you can use. Um, and, and this is publicly available on our website or through NOAA. And so uh, just you could go to that site on the bottom there to look at that if you haven't uh, heard of it. But this uh, uh, will play a role, we think, in the national effort for coastal and marine spatial planning, CMSP. And there's a national workshop in the Department of the Interior, actually, we're the host this June, which will uh, really move that forward. And that's being driven by the National Ocean Commission, 
uh, which is um, you know the the high level uh, uh, group that's being put together to uh, to oversee that and about four or five other key efforts to include climate change, et cetera. Um, Okay, getting specific to Massachusetts, um, there was lots of interest out there. We, when we go out for a request for interest, it's basically asking the industry, you know, what are your, you know, baseline thoughts about um, offshore areas? We received a total of 258 comments, and uh, you can see them there. Uh, 11 of them were submissions of interest from companies. All the responses are, are posted at that website. And you can get, you know, go on to the Massachusetts Renewable Energy page to, uh, to look into all of these. We haven't made decisions yet to uh, offer leases, but we're working towards that direction. Um, this was the original uh, very broad brush, uh, you know, potential area. Um, you can see that um, it was rather large and we had a series of meetings with constituents. Uh, due to concerns uh, by the fishing community and others, uh, this has, we, we made the decision to reduce this area to this. Now, this may be controversial to some of you in the room. Some may think, uh, why, did, you know, why isn't it the original? But um, you can expect probably that, that that site won't be the final either. As we work through this, this, uh, this uh, integration of multiple use in the best way to uh, focus on what areas should be leased in the federal waters. Uh, we, we're continuing to work on, on the, uh, um, the best available and the least contentious areas to offer for federal leases. So what will happen eventually, and not that far from now in time, um, that will be further specified and, and then we'll see if there is a, enough interest to hold a competitive lease sale for these tracks out there. These are tracks that are three miles uh, square. They just are uh, standard protraction diagrams. And the shaded area are, are the, the tra uh, traffic safety zones uh, from the Coast Guard. So next steps, uh, we're looking at all the comments, looking at the expressions of interest, continuing to hold our meetings, and uh, the, the intergovernmental task force meetings especially. And we're preparing a draft call for information and nomination for those areas offshore that uh, industry wants to move ahead on. And then, of course, we'll open a public comment period at that point. Now, in a, in a more general sense, where are we? Uh, we've already leased uh, some inter interim policy leases off New Jersey and Delaware. There, that was the, during uh, when we were writing the regs a few years back. The, in the interim, there was so much um, interest by states to get out there to put in MET towers and do site assessment, we developed an interim policy to allow some of these preliminary leases that don't convey commercial rights, but they do let them get out there and do some assessments. So we've got four of those off those states. And of course, Cape, Cape Wind, um, lots and lots of work um, on that as, as we took over from the Corps of Engineers some years ago. We're getting uh, closer. The construction and operations plan was recently accepted. So uh, that's moving ahead. Um, and. The Secretary of the Interior developed a Smart from the Start initiative, which is uh, intended to develop, uh, to identify uh, general wind energy areas offshore uh, the, the East Coast states, where we'd, wherein we would try to streamline the permitting process to encourage things to move ahead in a, in a quicker fashion. And where my agency, for example, um, is looking at doing the, some of the environmental work that would allow um, uh, industry to save some time and effort on that. And um, so in addition, down the bottom here, the WEAs, uh, the, the wind energy area is what I'm talking about. We have uh, several of them offshore the mid-Atlantic right now that are, that are under development, but we're getting closer to uh, working on these, these wind energy areas off Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and North Carolina. So in the meantime, we're also looking at decisions on issuing commercial wind leases off Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia this year. So it's coming fast. Um, we're excited, and um, we're, you know, we're here to, uh, to learn from you as well as share what we're doing. So thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ruth, for your introduction. In uh, my presentation, I'm going to briefly describe the major facets of the regulatory program of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with a focus on wind power proposals on the Outer Continental Shelf. This slide shows the laws that give the Corps the authority to regulate and issue permits for wind power projects. Pursuant to Section 4F of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act as amended, permits are required for the construction of artificial islands, installations, and other devices on the seabed to the seaward limit of the Outer Continental Shelf. These regulations were also applicable for nearshore activities, and Section 404 jurisdiction applies to all waters of the United States, including inland water bodies and wetlands. These are other major federal environmental laws that directly affect the administration of the Corps' regulatory program. As part of our permit process, we must ensure that the provisions of these laws are complied with as they apply to specific proposals. This slide describes the regulations that outline permitting requirements for the Corps' regulatory program, along with the administrative appeals process and compensatory mitigation, more commonly known as the mitigation rule. The 404B1 guidelines are rather expansive, but the focal requirement is the analysis of alternatives. In order for a project to comply with the guidelines, the Corps must determine that there are no practicable alternatives to a proposed discharge of dredged or fill material into waters of the United States, and that the proposed discharge will not have substantial adverse environmental consequences either individually or cumulatively. The litmus test for deciding whether a proposal receives a permit is the public interest review process. The Corps must determine that a given proposal would not be contrary to the public interest in order to issue a permit. This slide lists some of the factors that we consider as part of the public interest review process. Some factors may or may not be applicable to a given proposal, and the specific weight that each factor carries in the review process varies from project to project. The Nationwide General Permit Program is described in Part 330 of our regulations. At present, there are 49 nationwide permits that authorize specific types of activities on a national basis. Core districts have regional general permits that authorize specific types of activities on a regional basis. Many core districts also have programmatic general permits, mostly state program general permits, to avoid unnecessary duplication in reviews of projects where existing state regulatory programs substantively meet the requirements of our program. The letter of permission process is an abbreviated processing procedure for mostly minor projects that cannot be authorized under a general permit. There is a public participation process for applications for standard permits. The Corps must consider all substantive comments received in response to a public notice as part of the public interest review process. An expression of a high degree of public support or opposition is a qualitative, not quantitative, review factor. Comments are best submitted in writing to ensure that concerns are actu accurately captured and evaluated. Districts have implemented electronic distribution of public notices over the past decade, which has improved the efficiency of the program and eliminated reproduction and postage costs. As Bob alluded to, Bomer is the major player for wind farm projects on the Outer Continental Shelf. For proposals within three miles of the coast, the Corps is the lead federal agency. The Corps and Bomer have a close collaborative working relationship that we are seeking to enhance through development of a memorandum of understanding 
that will spell out a standard operating procedure governing how our agencies interact for projects on the Outer Continental Shelf. There's a, I'm sorry, next slide. Uh, these are some issues that could arise during review of an application for a wind farm. As districts review specific wind farm proposals, the knowledge base on some fisheries and wildlife issues will grow. Lessons learned in these reviews will be shared regionally. This slide shows projects on the Outer Continental Shelf that are in the pre-application stage in the New England, New York, and Philadelphia districts of the Corps. There may be other projects that are contemplated that have not yet received the pre reached the pre-application stage in these districts, as well as the Baltimore and Norfolk districts. Here are some recommendations to follow. It is usually prudent to hold a pre-application meeting with the appropriate core district once you get past the conceptual project stage. Other federal and state agencies may participate in such a meeting to provide input, or you may need to meet with these agencies separately. The last bullet is very important. Communication is key. This slide and the next slide show regional core contacts who can direct you to the appropriate district for an offshore project. There is an avatar to assist you in locating the appropriate core district office for land-based projects. Just visit the core website at www.usace.army.mil and click on Obtain a Permit under the Hot Topics section on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, the contact information on this slide is myself. My territory is basically from uh, Maine to Virginia. We have the uh, New England District, which covers the New England states. New York District uh, handles New York waters and New Jersey waters up to about one-third down the coast. Uh, then we have the Philadelphia District, which handles the lower two-thirds of New Jersey. Baltimore, which ha and Philadelphia has Delaware as well. Baltimore District handles the piece of Maryland that is uh, off the Delmarva Peninsula. And then Norfolk District would have the lower part of the Delmarva Peninsula and the ocean area down to the uh, North Carolina border. I appreciate, the I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with this information today. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my assignment today was to uh, kind of give a general regulatory environment overview for the offshore wind um, market. And as you can tell from the presentations that, uh, that Bob and Jim have already have gone through, it's, it can be quite a complicated um, endeavor. And so what I'm going to do is, is present uh, a very high level uh, overview, as I say, kind of um, presenting a little bit of information on the federal side, but since we've already heard about that, maybe focus a little bit more on the state process and, and to a certain extent, the, um, the local process as well. And this isn't working. It's the side one. It's the side one. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the, the first slide here, how do you determine uh, if you've got a project what, uh, what you're going to be involved with. And there's really two things um, that make up the framework. Uh, it's really the geography, where's the project located, and what are the potential effects. And so for an offshore wind project, um, there's state waters and federal waters generally defined, um, for most of the country at least, uh, by the three, mile, or the three nautical mile limit. If you're inside of that, then you're in state waters. If you're outside of that, you're in federal waters. And, and um, to a certain extent, in most cases, from the municipal perspective, uh, that would be concurrent with the, with the, um, the state water jurisdiction. 
Um, as far as the potential effects, um, really two broad categories, natural, uh, the natural resource effects and then the, um, the effects on the social and economic side. Um, so again, briefly, we've, we've heard about the federal side to a certain extent, but um, when you look at the federal agencies that can participate in an offshore wind project, um, there are obviously more than just uh, Bomer and, and the Corps of Engineers that would be involved. Um, and so we've listed those here. There's Bomer, there's the Coast Guard, obviously for traffic and safety, navigation concerns, um, the Corps of Engineers, EPA, uh, NOAA for the, um, for the uh, commerce and biological resources, and then the, uh, the folks that are interested in the aesthetics and the cultural resource uh, side of the picture. There we go. Um, focusing now on the on the, the state side um, and, and looking specifically at Massachusetts, um, there are again a number of agencies as you can imagine that are involved in this. But the lead agency really in the the the, the is the um, is the uh, the Secretary of Environmental and uh, sorry, <laughs> the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs and the, and the MEPA office process. Um, Kind of the initial process that any project would go through in Massachusetts, it's uh, it's a great process to solicit public input into the process. Um, essentially, the project is 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 uh, presented in, in a public notice, the environmental notification form. Um, input is solicited, reviewed by the MEPA office, and the secretary will issue a scoping document that will provide the overall framework for the information that has to be developed in order to provide sufficient information to assess the impact of the project. Um, and ultimately, and, and there are nuances on this, but typically the process would go through a draft environmental report and then a final environmental impact report and receive a certificate from the secretary and then could proceed into the uh, 